In a few weeks' time, part of the body of St. Bernadette Subiru is going to travel beneath the sea via the Eura Tunnel. The destination is the United Kingdom and the start of a tour of the relics of St. Bernadette around Britain. St. Bernadette is one of the most popular saints of the Catholic Church. She was the young French peasant girl whose visions of the Virgin Mary in the Pyrenees in 1858 led to the discovery of a spring near the village of Lourdes. Since then, countless people have visited Lourdes on pilgrimage for its healing waters. While honouring the relics of saints remains a strong part of Catholic culture, it is nevertheless a tradition that remains controversial and perhaps even repellent to others. During the Reformation, Protestants rejected shrines and relics as money spinning. And so violent was the opposition that many of the great shrines of Scotland and England, including those with relics of saints, were smashed to pieces. Yet Catholics have continued to honour relics. Perhaps a modern analogy explaining their appeal would be the contemporary desire for mementos of the famous, of celebrities. People want that connection to others they admire. Just think of the vast sums paid for autographs of the Beatles or belongings of the Beatles, a guitar that John Lennon had played or whatever. I heard the other day that Olivia Newton-John's black leather jacket from Greece is about to be auctioned, estimated at $200,000. And so fascinated by Princess Diana that bidders have just recently fought to buy a Ford Escort that once belonged to her and then eventually sold uh, for an astonishing £650,000. More bizarrely, I read that a dentist in Vancouver, particularly drawn to things that correlate with his profession, has among his collection a mould of Elvis Presley's mouth and John Lennon's rotten molar teeth tooth. But for Catholics, relics are much more serious and they're about much more than admiration. Interest in relics began around the second century as the number of Christian martyrs increased and their tormented bodies were venerated. And these bodies were also considered to be a link between heaven and earth. When we welcome the relics of St. Bernadette to Carfin, it will be a tangible link uniting us here on earth with this little messenger from God through his Holy Mother. This small, weakly, illiterate peasant girl was the chosen vessel of the message that Our Lady intended for the world in 1858. Bernadette was, for this very intense period in the public eye, people treated her like a living saint. If they saw her, they wanted to touch her. They wanted to take bits of her clothes. She was very much a local celebrity and she didn't want any part of this. Rather, she shunned all publicity and praise. She desperately wanted to escape the publicity that surrounded her in her little village. And at last, at 22 years of age, she went off to a convent in a place called Nevers, where she remained hidden for the rest of her life. After all the attention she received from the apparitions, she referred to herself as the broom placed behind the door after it has been used. I've no doubt that Bernadette would be astonished at the publicity generated by the arrival of her relics in the United Kingdom. So in a few weeks' time, on the 24th of September in Carfin Grotto, we will welcome her as a messenger 
from heaven, calling us to heed Jesus' mother's call to forsake those paths of life which cause us to drift further and further from the path laid out for us by her Son. Our Blessed Lady asked Bernadette to spread the message that sinners should return to her Son. We hope and we pray that this message will be heard anew by all those coming to venerate the relics of this little peasant girl, Bernadette Subiru. Saint Bernadette of Lourdes, pray for us. On the 7th of January, 1844, Francois Subaru and his wife Louise Castoreau welcomed their baby girl into the world at the Bolly Mill in the small town of Lourdes in the south of France. Two days later, in the parish church of Saint-Pierre, the baby girl was christened Marie Bernard Subaru, who would be known as Bernadette. Unfortunately, the happy arrival was soon to be overshadowed when a candle fell on Louise, setting fire to her blouse and leaving her unable to feed her new baby girl. Bernadette's parents entrusted their daughter to a wet nurse in the nearby town of Bartrez, Marie Lag, who was a friend and customer of the mill, paying her five francs per month to look after and feed their daughter. Bernadette would stay in Bartrez for around 18 months before returning to the bully mill at Lourdes on the 1st of April 1846. By now, Louise was expecting another child and the family welcomed Toinette Subaru on September the 17th, 1846. Soon misfortune would return for the family. Times were changing and with new steam-powered mills arriving, the family began to have money troubles. In 1848, Francois was blinded in one eye when a stone chip hit him when working on the millstone. This was then followed with the death of their son, Jean-Marie, on the 4th of January, 1851. By 1852, their situation became much worse when the mill owner sold the Bolly Mill and the new owner decided to work the mill himself. Francois had to look for work elsewhere, and by 1854, unable to pay rent, the family were forced to leave. Times were hard. In the autumn of 1855, a cholera plague broke out in Lourdes. Bernadette became gravely ill. Her mother and father prayed to Our Lady Health of the Sick for her recovery. Bernadette recovered, however she began to suffer from chronic asthma. This same year, Louise's mother, Claire Castro, died, leaving the family 900 francs. They used this money to rent another mill. However, when the harvest failed, once again the family faced eviction. For a short time, they ended up at Reeves' house. However, unable to pay the modest rent, they were left penniless and homeless. The family found shelter in the cashew an old, damp prison building in which the family stayed in one small room which was previously a punishment cell. The whole family worked to make ends meet. Francois worked as a day labourer, Louise a cleaner, and Bernadette collected bones and scrap to sell, and she also looked after her siblings. In March 1857, Francois was accused of stealing by the baker. He was arrested, imprisoned and finally released one week later through lack of evidence. In September 1858, Bernadette once again left Lourdes and worked for her old nurse, Marie Lag in Bartrez. Here Bernadette tended to the flock, worked in the home and looked after Marie Lag's son Jean, who was two years old. Life was hard for Bernadette in Bartrez. She spent time learning the Catechism in order to prepare for her First Holy Communion. Her love of her family gave her the desire to return to Lourdes. She returned to Lourdes and began attending pauper's classes 
at the hospice run by the Sisters of Charity of Nevers. On the 11th of February 1858, the town of Lourdes in a damp, cold fog. Having no wood for the fire, Bernadette, her sister Toinette, and their friend Jean Abadi, who later in life met the founder of Carfing Grotto, Canon Taylor, went to the area known as Massabiel to collect wood for the fire and to look for bones to sell. Toinette and Jean removed their clogs to cross the stream. Bernadette, however, waited, not wanting to get her feet wet. I heard a noise like a gust of wind. I raised my eyes towards the grotto and saw a lady dressed in white. Join with us next Friday as we continue the story of Saint Bernadette.